<coughs> Excuse me. All right, well, let me begin by reading our text again. We're trying to go through the book of Acts relatively quickly, trying to get more of the big picture instead of the, the minutia. We are picking up some of the small details as we go along, but hopefully just to embellish what it is that is in the main picture. And the main picture we see here, of course, is the Lord working in His church, empowering His church to do really what He saved us to do. And, and that is to, well, to do a few things, of course, to worship Him, but also to serve Him, to evangelize, to share that gospel with other people, even if the people we share it with don't necessarily want to hear it. That is the case, really. If the people aren't converted, they're never going to enjoy listening to it. But that's the only way they can be saved, right? They have to hear the message, and God is the one who will make it powerful to save if that is His good pleasure. All right, well, let's pick up the narrative in verse 1 of chapter 8. And this is, of course, just following the, the stoning of Stephen. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice. And many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Now there was a man named Simon, who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on to the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give, me this, or give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter. For your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Well, may the Lord... Bless his word to our hearing this morning. Well, last time, remember, we were looking at Luke's account of, of really our first new covenant brother, okay, who laid down his life for Jesus. We need to remember we're connected to the story, aren't we? This isn't something that just happened to a group of people years ago. Even as we read the Old Testament scriptures, we know we're reading our story there, the story of our redemption because we are benefiting from what Jesus did with the Jews. Now, Stephen was doing many signs and wonders among the people. He was bringing a powerful argument 
a powerful apologetic for the faith. Remember, that's what we're trying to learn in the evening is how we might be able to defend the Christian faith. That's what Stephen was doing, and he was doing it so powerfully that it drew the attention of our Lord's enemies, and they arrested him. And during his trial, he continued to do the same thing, brought, again, a strong defense for Jesus Christ. He brought a very clear and pointed message against the Jewish leaders that just as their fathers had resisted the Spirit of God and persecuted every messenger the Lord had sent them to tell them about the coming Messiah, so they were resisting the Holy Spirit now and persecuting the messengers He had sent them uh, sent to them basically to tell them that Jesus is their Messiah who had risen from the dead. And of course, as is always the possibility, they became angry, and in their outrage, they condemned Stephen to death and they stoned him. But let's not forget that what happens while Stephen was being pummeled by their rocks, that the Lord graciously opened a window into heaven. It's not that the clouds parted, but he saw even beyond the blue sky, and he saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of the Father, ready to receive him. And as he was dying, Stephen also did what our Lord calls us to do. He prayed that the Lord might have mercy on his enemies, and after he prayed, he died. Now, we know that sometimes it can be dangerous to be a Christian uh, particularly when we stand up for the truth and when we stand out for the truth. But remember the Lord said He would always be there to watch over us. He said to His disciples and He says to us, I am with you always. And He also said that He's prepared many places in heaven and that He was going to come and receive us to Himself so that when our time comes, we don't have to be afraid. We only need to trust Him. And to make sure that out of love for Him, we are seeking to be faithful, even as our brother Stephen was. Now, this morning, we see the Lord beginning to move His church outwards. Uh, Jesus told His disciples uh, before He ascended into heaven that when the Spirit of God came, that they would receive power to be His witnesses, and they were to begin in Jerusalem and then move outward to Judea and Samaria, and then from there to the remotest part of the earth. Now, up until this time, their ministry had been in Jerusalem, basically all in Jerusalem. The Lord had saved many thousands of Jews through them. The apostles had also discipled them and prepared them for ministry. But who's to say when it's time for them actually to move out and begin to serve the Lord themselves? Well, it's the Lord's, and He shows them now that it is time for them to leave and to go out and minister the gospel to others. Now, the first thing we see here is what the Lord uses to motivate them. He uses persecution. As soon as Stephen was executed, the Jewish leaders let loose their anger, and they instituted a citywide attack against the church. Remember, at first... They reluctantly were tolerating the Christians. Mainly it was because they were afraid of what the Jewish people would do to them uh, because they were held in high esteem by the people. They didn't want uh, the, the people to come and basically create a rebellion which would bring Rome in and then they would lose their position of authority. But now that they had taken this step of killing Stephen, they were no longer willing to hold back. Now you know how it is. Whenever we take one step in sin, it, it tends to open the floodgates of our corruption. It becomes almost impossible to stop ourselves from going further and further and further. You know, uh, John Owen once talked about the idea that um, our hearts are full of corruption. There's a lot of temptation out here. Temptation is like a hand reaching out towards us. Our corruption is like a hand reaching out towards the temptation. And once those two basically take hold of one another, it's, it's nearly impossible to break that connection and inevitably will fall into sin, which is why we need to stay away from the temptation, why we ask the Lord, don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But the same thing is true once we make that connection, we're tempted, we fall into sin, that we go further and further into sin. 
And that's why it's so important that, again, we not only avoid temptation, but having uh, compromised, that we don't allow ourselves even, you know, any further compromise because even the smallest sin in our lives can compromise, grieve, quench the Holy Spirit, and take away something of our desire to serve the Lord. And that weakens us and makes it easier for us to fall into sin. Now, if that's the case with us who actually have a desire to love the Lord and to serve Him, how much more difficult would it be for those who hate Him to keep themselves from sinning more? Now, notice who was at the head of this particular attack. It's Saul. Now, this is our first introduction to the one who later by God's grace will become the greatest champion of Christianity that is recorded in the Bible next to our Lord Himself. He's the one who almost single-handedly evangelizes the entire Roman Empire in his life and travels through it more than one time. Look at what Saul is like here, apart from the grace of God. I mean, first of all, Luke tells us that he was in hearty agreement. In other words, he was wholeheartedly approving that Stephen should die. Now, we know that he hated Stephen because Stephen stood for Christ and he was arguing for Christ. And Paul, as a Jew, as a Pharisee, hated Christ. But I think it's also possible that he hated Stephen even more because in his argumentation with Stephen, he had been bested by him. Remember, we saw that Saul may likely have been one of those Jews that was a part of the synagogue of the freedmen with whom or with which Stephen was arguing. Perhaps it was his failure here that further provoked him to try to stamp out all Christianity because if all Christians can argue as well as Stephen, perhaps uh, this sect is going to be around longer than we want it to and maybe some Jews will go into this, into this heresy. There's nothing that a proud heart hates more than someone who is better at something than they are. And Stephen, certainly empowered by the Holy Spirit, was better at arguing his point than Paul, especially when you have the truth on your side. And that's something that should encourage us as we, again, learn how to argue for the truth of Christianity. Now, the Lord tells us that there is only one area in which we are allowed to try and outdo one another, and that is in showing honor to one another, in encouraging one another, in prizing each other's gifts and the things that we do for the Lord. You know, in other words, pride has no place in a Christian. And really, it was pride, I think, that provoked him more than anything else to attack Christianity. And so Saul began ravaging the church, trying to destroy the church, entering house after house, anywhere he suspected there might be believers, arresting both men and women, showing no mercy to any, but throwing them into prison, and as we know, to put them on trial for their lives. Again, this is Saul, you know, before the grace of God comes in his life, and, you know, we've all heard the expression, but for the grace of God, there go I. The same thing could be true of us, and we need to remember what we were like and what we could potentially have been like if the Lord had not been restraining our sins our entire lives and if He hadn't saved us. If the Lord had not had mercy on us, we could have been as bad or worse than Saul. But thank the Lord, He has given to us His love, and that makes all the difference in the world. But now while Saul was fighting against Jesus, some more virtuous souls, devout men who, who loved Him, okay, they were honoring His fallen servant. Let's not forget about Stephen. Okay, Stephen had just been stoned. So they took Stephen and they buried him and they made loud lamentation over him. They wept and I don't think it was make, you know, the noisemakers of the professional mourners. These were people who really loved Stephen. They loved Stephen because he loved his Lord and because he was actively serving him and giving honor to God. Here is a servant now who is no longer present to serve the Lord and they missed him. Now those who love the Lord also love his servants. And I think especially those who bring glory to Him. Now think about, you know, just a few years ago, R.C. Sproul passed away. You know, how did you feel about that? 
Here's somebody who spent his whole life serving the Lord and who was promoting God's truth and had helped a number of people and, and through these you know, various conferences that they were having were promoting the gospel and strengthening the church. I think many of us admired him and were sad that he's gone because he was able to do something in a way that, that nobody else really can. And I think as we think about Charles Spurgeon, as we think about George Whitfield, as we think about Jonathan Edwards, all giants in their particular sphere, how much we would love for these men still to be present, or at least those like them, with these kinds of gifts in order to glorify the Lord. Now, the reason why we desire that is because we love the Lord, and we appreciate what these men were able to do for Him and for His glory. You see, that, that is another indication of our love for the Lord. Our love for the Lord wants us to see that, not so that we can sit under them and be ministered to by them. That's how we often think about it. Well, I'd love to see George Whitfield in action. You know, I'd love to hear him preach and see the effect it might have on me. Or listening to Charles Spurgeon or Jonathan Edwards. I mean, you know, it, it's very interesting. But it's what these men could do for God's glory and how He used them to save people for His glory. That's really what we should love about them. And I think that's what these men loved about Stephen and why they were so sad that he was gone. But we need to remember God knows best, doesn't He? And when their work is finished, He takes them to heaven so that they can rest from their labors. You know, the time of work that we have for the Lord is really so very brief compared to the eternity in which He is going to basically bless us and take care of us in heaven as we get to enjoy His presence. Now, this also should move us to do two things. We should pray that God would save and raise up more people like this, more like the ones that I've mentioned, more like Stephen, but also that He would make us more like them, that He'd make us all more like Jesus so that we can bring more glory and honor to our Lord. But now again, notice the effect that this persecution had on the church and this killing of Stephen. It basically lit a fire, didn't it? It pressured the disciples to leave Jerusalem except for the apostles and to take the gospel throughout Judea and Samaria. Sometimes the Lord needs to light a fire under us to get us to start moving, right? And when that happens, we need to understand what that fire is for. We need to understand what He's doing. And we need to do our best to work together with Him. And I think the, the disciples understood and they began to go out and to do that work, to, to broaden their range. So we see here that the Jewish leaders and Saul meant this for evil, but the Lord meant it for good. Now, secondly, we go down into Samaria and we see what the Lord is doing there. Luke tells us that after the disciples were scattered, they went about telling everyone that they could about Jesus. And again, let's remember that that is the goal of discipleship, that we begin to do for others what the Lord has done for us through others. You know, if somebody had not brought the gospel to us, we'd still be in darkness and we would not know the Lord. The Lord wants us to share the good news of what He has done to save sinners, to, you know, for, for what He's done through His Son for everyone who believes. Well, now we see that Philip went down to the city of Samaria. By the way, there is a city called Samaria and there is a region called Samaria. So this is the capital of Samaria. It used to be the capital of the northern kingdom, right? So he goes to that city, which is in Samaria, the city of Samaria, and begins preaching Christ to them. Now, up to this time, the gospel apparently had not come to them. It was not the town Jesus ministered to when he stopped at the well at Sychar, basically. This is a different city. This is the capital. Remember the Samaritans were that half-Jew, half-Gentile people that were formed because of the, well, the um, captivity of the northern kingdom. They took many of the Jews out and dispersed them throughout basically the entire world. And then they took people from these other countries and they put them into Israel where the northern kingdom used to be and the people intermarried and they became these Samaritans. And that's why the Jews hated them because they were only half-Jew the other half was Gentile. They considered them to be unclean. But as the Lord is shortly going to show Peter with regard to the God-fearing Gentiles, Cornelius and his household, what the Lord has cleansed, we should no longer consider unclean. 
And so Philip goes down and he ministers the gospel to them. And as he preached the good news, the people listened. They saw the signs that God was doing through him. Demonic spirits were being cast out. Those who were paralyzed and lame were being healed. They were overjoyed that God had visited them in this way for His mercies. And they also believed and were baptized. It sounds like the whole city believed. Now, one of the mysteries of the Old Covenant was being revealed. Remember how the Jews thought that essentially they would be a light for the world and they would be God's peculiar people, but they didn't seem to understand that Gentiles would one day be converted and brought into the family of God. Well, that was being revealed here now. Uh, Through the gospel, the Lord was bringing the nations to Himself. But as I've said, it appears as though the whole city actually believed them. And again, cities in those days were not gigantic. They weren't that big. So there were hundreds, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, probably hundreds, okay, who who came. But among them, we see there was at least one hypocrite. And we have to assume more than one, but this one is the one that is singled out. Luke singles out this particular individual to show us or to remind us that not everybody who believes the terms of the gospel, not even everybody who is baptized with water, is necessarily born again, is necessarily a true believer. That's why I read, remember, the parable of the sower. Jesus there warns us that there are four possible responses to the good news. Most people reject it. Some receive it for a while, but then fall away under persecution or because of desire for the world But there are those few who embrace it wholeheartedly and who bear fruit. Now, many of the Samaritans, perhaps, during this time of revival fell in that last category. Perhaps many of them were saved. But we know at least one of them fell into the category of the thorny ground here. I think that would be the one we want to put him in. And that is Simon. Simon was a magician who appears to have been quite good at what he did. Some commentators believe that his magic was real, that it was demonically inspired, perhaps like that of the Egyptians. Remember who opposed Moses and tried to basically do tit for tat as he did miracles. They would also try to do miracles until Moses very quickly outdistanced them because it was the power of God working through him. Others believe that he practiced the rites or science of the Magi. I mean, the word magus is is a verb that's used here in in the word magician. He practiced these magical arts. Uh, These were the Persians who were addicted to the study of philosophy, astronomy, and medicine. Others believe that he was a fortune teller, that he would go into some kind of ecstatic trance and somehow he could tell the future. But still others believe that his magic was really nothing more than the magic we see today, which is essentially an illusion that was meant to deceive the Samaritans. Well, whatever it was, It worked. Now, his presentation was so effective that they actually believed he was somebody great. They called him the great power of God. Some believe what they meant by this was that he was actually the Messiah. Let's not forget that Jesus actually did go into Samaria. He did minister to a town in Samaria. They believed that he was the Messiah. They undoubtedly began sharing that message with other people. And eventually, everybody in Samaria had heard about Jesus, but perhaps they were thinking that this man was that Messiah. But when Simon saw what Philip could do, something real, something that couldn't be explained perhaps by a sleight of hand or misdirection, he also believed. He believed, okay? And he was baptized. And as he continued to follow Philip, he was constantly amazed at what Philip was able to do. Now, we see a little bit of a parenthesis here, and this is a very important one because it's going to lead up to revealing to what Simon's heart was really like. And that is when the apostles who were still in Jerusalem heard that the Samaritans had received the gospel, they sent their representatives, Peter and John. And when they arrived and saw what God was doing there, they prayed that God might give them His Holy Spirit. Now, the interesting thing is that 
Philip had gone down. He was doing signs and wonders. He was preaching the gospel. People were being saved. They were being baptized. But the Spirit had not yet been poured out on them. They had been born again by the Spirit. They had received the sign of the Spirit's work of regeneration in water baptism. But they had not received the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the promise of the new covenant. That is the promise that Peter is referring to on the day of Pentecost. You know, repent and be baptized and you will receive the, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit because the promise is for you. The promise of the Holy Spirit, that which God had promised to give His people in the new covenant to give them the power to live for the glory of God the ability to, again, become like Jesus. And the question really is, why hadn't the Lord yet given His Spirit? Well, as we go through the book of Acts, we notice that there are a few occasions where that happened, where the Spirit was not given unless one of the apostles, one or more, were present. I mean, we're going to see the same thing is going to be true with regard to Cornelius and his household. Peter was present when the Spirit was poured out on them. So what is the answer to this question? Well, my New Testament professor in seminary, Dennis Johnson, suggested that this was basically meant to make sure that these new congregations that were being formed from different people groups, as the gospel is now moving outside of the Jewish culture and now moving to the Samaritans and moving to the Gentiles, to make sure that those churches that, that were established in each of those people groups were connected strongly to the church of Jerusalem, okay? The Lord wanted the churches to be together until, at least until He had finished laying the foundation of His Word through them so that there wouldn't be several churches of Jesus Christ that had differing beliefs, but one church that had the same belief. Now, sadly, that connection did not remain. You know, we know there comes a time when the apostles, you know, had to leave Jerusalem and so forth. They, they were no longer monolithic, and the churches moved away from this unity over the years. You know, since the days of the apostles, that's essentially what's happened. Just look at the world today. Look at all the different churches that exist. Look at even all the different Protestant churches that exist. But yet, it was still important that the church remain together and that this foundation be laid so that those who would stray from it later would be able to come back to that truth through a careful study of the Word of God. So essentially, God was not giving His Spirit in certain instances because He wanted to keep the church together. Okay? He wanted it to be monolithic for a time. And even though we may be scattered through many different denominations and beliefs, thankfully, God still knows those who are His. There is still but one church, and we are all one in the Lord Jesus. Those of us who are, of course, saved among all these different groups of people. Now, another interesting question is this. How did the disciples or the apostles make this determination that the Samaritans had not yet received the Spirit? What is it that was lacking? Well, it's because when the Spirit was given in those days, the evidence was very often speaking in tongues, okay? Now, that happened on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God was poured out upon the apostles and the disciples who were already saved. They already had the Spirit. You know, they were already born again, but they didn't have this power of the Holy Spirit. But when He came on them, they spoke in tongues, that was the evidence to all the Jews all around them that God was at work here, okay? This was the evidence to Peter that Cornelius and his household had also received the Spirit. Remember when he is basically later goes to the apostles and the church leaders in Jerusalem and he tells them what the Lord did among these Gentiles. And when they heard that the Gentiles were speaking in tongues, they said, well, if God has given them that gift... How can we withhold baptism from them as well? How can we not include them into the church? Okay, that was the evidence that they had this promise from the Father that is only for believers. And then this also was the evidence to Paul that the disciples of John the Baptist that he meets later in Ephesus, that they had also received the Spirit of God. 
<clears throat> now, we don't read in our passage that the Samaritans spoke in tongues, but there had to be some way that they understood that, 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 that they received the Spirit, that they didn't have the Spirit, but that they received it, that Peter could see it, that John could see it, and that even Simon knew it had taken place. Had to be something, right? I think it's most likely that they spoke in tongues, okay? That was the evidence God was giving. Now, I don't think that we should draw the conclusion from this that everybody who receives the promise of the Holy Spirit, by the way, I want to kind of get away from the idea of baptism of the Holy Spirit because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is really what places somebody who is dead into Christ to make them alive. That's not a secondary, you know, secondary to being saved, it is being saved. So I think we need to kind of reserve the idea of baptism of the Holy Spirit for that. But everybody who receives this power of the Holy Spirit, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we should not draw the conclusion that everybody who receives it speaks in tongues. Even in Paul's day, that wasn't true. He tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 30, all do not speak with tongues, do they? And the expected answer is, of course not, no, okay? Not even in Paul's day. And of course, with regard to today, we believe that tongues have served their purpose and so have passed away. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, if there are tongues, they will cease. And we do believe that with the coming of the perfect, the perfect revelation of God's will and His Word when Scripture was completed, that they did, in fact, cease. But yet, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit continues. That's what the Great Awakening was about, the Second Great Awakening. That's what revival is about. That's what we need to be seeking is the outpouring of this Holy Spirit. But now getting back to Simon. When he saw the Spirit was given through the laying on of hands, he offered Peter and John money for the ability to do the same thing, for which Peter gave him one of the strongest recorded rebukes in Scripture. He starts off in verse 20, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Now, the Spirit of God is a gift that God gives purely by His grace in the same way that He gives the gift of salvation. And to try and buy the ability to give the Spirit turns His gift into something earned and so falls under that same condemnation. Remember, those who are under the works of the law, that is, if you try to save yourself by works, you are under the curse. Simon is essentially under the same curse because he's trying to buy something that God gives freely, that is the Spirit of God. Then he says, secondly, you have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. You, basically, you're not saved. You're not a part of this body. You're not a part of Christ. You don't have the Spirit of God. This is clear evidence that though he had been baptized with water, and even though he had believed the facts about Christianity, he had not been baptized by the Holy Spirit in the sense that I was referring to of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He was still unregenerate. He was still dead in his trespasses and sins. So then Peter counsels him, therefore repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. I mean, what is the only cure for somebody who is in Simon's position? They have to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what, they're, that's what Peter is counseling him to do. Turn away from this evil desire to Jesus so that your sins might be forgiven. And then he enforces that by one other observation. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. He's using here a rather, um, what would you call this? Uh, it's a rather um, um, graphic uh, picture of bile, you know, bile is bitter, very bitterly bitter, you might say, and he has, has gall, essentially, in his soul, poison in his soul, and his heart is still bound by sin. So I think you can see very clearly Peter knew that Simon did not know the Lord. Now, did he know this because of some supernatural insight that the Lord gave to him? 
I don't think he needed supernatural insight to make this deduction from what Simon wanted to do. Here's some money. I want to buy the Holy Spirit so that I can give him away to whomever I want. Well, that's, that's evil. That's wicked. It shows that he doesn't know the Lord. Even just that expression. I mean, sounds like ignorance, but it sounds to me like he maybe wanted, again, people to think very highly of him. So this is a matter of pride. This is a matter of prestige. He, he wanted to benefit from the gospel. I mean, who would want to do that? Who would want to benefit from the gospel? I don't know anybody like that. Do you? Well, of course we do. So many of the people who are on television, if they're still on television, they still exist, they're, they're basically using the gospel, using Christ to make people think more highly of themselves and to make money. Well, that's exactly what Simon was doing and Peter was calling him out. And we do need to be careful about calling people out in public, okay? But I think we should warn Christians as we have the opportunity against those who are merchandising through the gospel. Now, lastly, notice how Simon responds. He, he doesn't repent, but he asks Peter and John to pray for him. Pray to the Lord for me yourselves so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now, as I read that, it appears to me that Simon is denying everything that Peter just said about him. You know, some commentators point to the fact that he was pointing just to the punishment, you know. Pray that, that I don't get punished, you know. Pray that my silver doesn't perish with me, that I don't perish in hell. But he says, pray that nothing of what you said may come upon me. It sounds to me like he's denying everything that Peter had to say. This isn't true of me. That's not, that's not the reason why I wanted to do this. But the main thing is, we need to see here, is he was still unchanged. He did not let go of his sin. You know, some believe that Simon Magus was actually the founder of Gnosticism. And maybe that goes along with his ties to, again, the Magi and, and the Persians who studied philosophy and astronomy and so forth because that's where Gnosticism comes from. It comes from pagan Greek thought and philosophy. He did not repent. So here are, again, indications his heart had not been changed because if his heart had been changed, then he would hate his sin and he would turn away from it. Now, as we prepare to come to the table this morning, I thought we could just, you know, end on this point and think about it for a moment and use this to examine our own hearts. What is it that we really love about God? What is it that we really hate, about, you know, about the things that are contrary to God, you know? And, and this is really asking the question, why did we come to Him in the first place? Is it because we hate sin and want to be free from sin so that we can basically live the way the Lord wants us to live, which is walking in the path of righteousness, living according to the law? Or did we run to Him because it was the punishment that we hated and we wanted to get away from? Uh, and we wanted the, basically the, the fire insurance policy to get out of hell, and that's why we came to Jesus. Well, it has to be more than a fear of hell. It has to be a love for Christ. We need to have something more in us than Simon had within himself when he first turned to the Lord and was baptized. We need to have a genuine love for the Lord. So let's, again, as I said, ask ourselves this question. Why are we trusting Jesus? Why do we want Him? Why do we want God? Why do we want that relationship? Why do we want to go to heaven? Is it because we want to get away from sin or is it because we want to get away from punishment? If it's just punishment, we need to be concerned. But if it is sin as well, and if it's because of holiness and righteousness that we want Christ and we want to be with Him, then that is a very strong indication that we really do belong to Him and that we should come to the table. So let's take just a few moments and let's bow and let's um, let the Lord search our hearts and through this prepare uh, to come to the table this morning.